subtle skills, big results. Welcome to the Ninja Selling Podcast. Welcome back to the Ninja Selling Podcast. Matt and Garrett are back with you again. We're excited to be with you, and we are in an environment that we are not normally in. It's quite incredible. Matt actually put this on to make sure this was all going to work. So, Matt, I'm going to toss it to you, and we're going to uh, sure. start our journey. Yeah, this is awesome. So, hello, everybody. Uh, we're in a room of about 50 amazing ninjas here. We're at a ninja installation here in Somerville, South Carolina. And so we're doing a live audience podcast, not a live podcast. We recorded this a few weeks ago, if you're listening to it on your favorite podcast app at the moment. But we have a live audience here with some questions, which is going to be awesome. And a big shout out to Prosecco and Post, which is a company that I own that is sponsoring this event. Can you give a, a shout out to yourself? I think so. I guess. I mean, I kind of... I sh probably should have done a that. Weird, it's, you, a weird, it's a weird thing. But do I do want to say thank you to Hoogan Southern Kitchen for hosting us in their space here. They have some amazing food. Shout out to the amazing crew here. And actually, Pugin's Porch downtown is my favorite brunch spot. So if anybody is going to be here post-installation and you want to have an awesome, awesome brunch, check out Pugin's Porch on Queen Street in downtown Charleston. It is amazing. Absolutely amazing. You want to talk about me? Well, we should, so Prosecco and Post, I'm going to give a shout out to Prosecco <laughs> and Post. Matt has an amazing postcard company. They do auto flow for people. And uh, he has two partners and they have worked hard to make sure that we can provide a podcast like this for all you tonight and for all the listeners that are here uh, on their computers, on their phones and whatnot. So, uh, Matt, thank you for doing this. It's going to be Absolutely. awesome. And we're excited to get going. So what's been going on is we've had an installation going in Charleston. And uh, the attendees that we have in the room with us today are all at that. In well, I don't know. Maybe people filed in who aren't part of the installation. They're like, hey, there's, I heard there's free beer upstairs. Yeah. Maybe we should go check that place out. So hopefully we have all the uh, installation attendees here. And what we've asked is for them to throw out some questions. We've also gone online and we asked for some questions to be tossed in. That's what we're going to cover today. And then we also have a special guest and we're going to bring him on here a little bit. He's been talking all day long, and he says he's still ready to go. So uh, we'll bring him in here in a little bit. So, uh, Matt, let's jump right in, man. Yeah, so this is going to be Q&A style, as we said. And, um, I mean, Garrett, I think we're going to just go with the big one because we, we had many it. people ask about this. I hear there's something going on with a lawsuit. And so it's been a question that a lot of ninjas are asking about this lawsuit. You know, what? what is, like, what do we do? Like, we had this settlement that happened, well, not a settlement, this decision that was happened where the National Association of Realtors, Keller Williams, and Home Services of America were found guilty of, well, you all know, can go look that up if you don't know the specifics behind it. But yeah, what does that mean for us? Do what a does little that mean for Ninja, reason. Garrett? I mean, it was a big, I mean, we're talking a big, big decision, five, over $5 billion. First and foremost, one thing we need to understand is that, you know, I've had a lot of people come to me and say, we like, Ninja needs to come out and say and talk and share our kind of perspective of where we're at with all of this. And we've been waiting a little bit for the dust to settle is really what we've been kind of doing. We're kind of trying to see where does this all stand? What does it all look like before we come out and say a whole lot? The biggest thing, and we've kicked it around with all the coaches, we've gone round and round in circles on this. And what does it all mean? How's it going to look? And what we keep coming back to is, is that first off, what I see in this time right now and what this lawsuit means for all of us as real estate agents is I've never seen a more important time to understand your value. Absolutely. And it's one of those things that I think on, especially on the, the buyer side, I mean, for years, I've asked people who are buyers agents and I'll say, what, you know, what is your value that you bring as a real estate agent? And a lot of them will say, like, I help people find homes. Like, that's my job is to help people find homes. Uh, and on the listing side, I've had a lot of people when I say, what is your value as a listing agent? And they'll say, well, my job is to help you find a buyer for your house. And my joke has always been is I can take a red can of paint and I can literally write for sale on the, my garage door of my house and I will find a buyer. Uh, so I don't need necessarily a real estate agent for that. And on the same thing on the on the buyer agent side, I mean, I can go and find a home. They're available. I can find them online. I've actually been looking at real estate online while I've been here in Charleston. I have not called a real estate agent yet. I do know some, but I haven't done that yet. And so I think, you know, first off, we need to understand that our job is well, way far above and beyond helping people find homes, find buyers and whatnot. And I think that's where I think us as ninjas, we really need to stop first 
and say, okay, what is our value? And I I see people getting so worried about this and they're frozen in this. And I think it's just the time to kind of push that off to the side and say, look, we don't even know what this is going to look like yet in a lot of areas. And it's our time to decide what our value is. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, a lot of people are like, well, what's going to change? And some things are probably going to change. And doesn't that happen all the time? I mean, our business changed in 2008. Our business changed through the teens. Our business changed during COVID. And this will probably change some things about the business. But it does highlight something, Garrett, that's frustrated me about the industry for a long time, which is that the assumption that buyer's agents are like, well, I'm just going to go do this deal and like, I'm going to get paid and like, everybody should work with a buyer's agent because it's free. And it's oh, that's not. My, that's my favorite. It's not free. <laughs> you are not free. You have a lot of value and people are willing to pay for the services that you provide if you see the value in yourselves. I mean, today, Dennis was going through the five points of value, right? We went through a lot of discussion about the value that you bring as an agent in general. And I think that's just going to highlight. So what does this mean? It means that ninjas are going to do fantastic no matter what changes happen because we focus on bringing value. I think that's going to be the biggest thing. Well, there's there's two sides of there's One's the understanding your value. And the other thing is, is that when you're in a confusing marketplace in a confusing time, what we know is, is people turn to people they know, like, and trust. We've already talked about that. We've talked about it all day, the know, like, and trust. So when you when you understand the know, like, and trust side, what happens is, is the more confusing the situation gets, the more you turn to your friends, the more you turn to people that you really can look to and say, okay, how can you guide me through and how can you help me through this time? I've never seen a better referral-based relationship marketplace than what we're in right now. And I'm sure all of you can agree to that. I am watching ninjas have the best years they have ever had in this industry right now in a marketplace where I'm sure all of you can find agents that are not having their best years. Like that's not hard to find, but we're seeing a ton of them. And it's every time I bring it up, I'm like, what is causing that to happen? And it always comes back to people need me. They want my services. They understand that they don't want to do this with a stranger and they want somebody they really trust. And that's where I say again, I would love to give a bigger, like, here's what you need to do. And here's the dialogues you need to say. And here's what this is all going to be. We really don't know all that yet, but you got to know what your value is. Yeah. And I, I will throw like a caution out as well as you're going to have a lot of people, you know, different systems, coaches, trainings, people who are just high in the real estate industry who are going to say things like, you need to throw it all out. You have to revamp everything in your business and watch out for those distractions because one, we have no idea what the long-term impact is going to be on any, because no, no other decisions have been made, right? Other than policy changes that have already happened from the NAR, right? Yep. So don't listen and be distracted to things. Focus on your business, focus on running your ninja systems and focus on providing value to your people because as the consumer base, that we're all paying attention to this, right? Now, some consumers have picked up on this because a pretty big number that was thrown out there, right? So it made some national news. But for the most part, what I hear when I, when agents, I ask agents, I'm like, so what, what do your clients say when they ask you about this? Or, or they, people have said, my clients have asked me about it. And what do you sell them? It's like, well, we don't know what the impact is. And I said, what do your clients say? They say, okay. <laughs> so keep on keeping on. Keep calm and carry on. I'm not, I'm not, from the people that I'm coaching, I'm not getting an overwhelming, my clients are bringing this to me and we're having to like have these conversations with them. A lot of this is in our world. It's in our backyard right now. We're all kind of trying to figure it out with all of our real estate buddies. And I think that's where we just need to kind of take a big deep breath, take a pause, I have heard rumors of people saying, I'm not paying my dues anymore. I'm not going, I'm going to just say, just, you can do whatever you want to do, but just hold on a second. Let's wait and see how this kind of plays out a little bit. There's a lot of things that are going to change. It's also very different state to state, association to association, brokerage to brokerage. So also follow the guidance of your broker in charge, right? Like they're the people that are going to be really in tune with what's going on at the real estate commission on a state level and association level. So pay attention to what, you know, they're talking about and have good conversations with them and you'll be fine. Now, from a ninja standpoint, real quick, and I think that, you know, one of the things that stopped us from like, again, coming out and saying, this is what you do, is it is happening very, very, very different state to state. The way states are handling this, way states, 
that have got way ahead of this and already put practices into play well before we even got here. Months and months and months ago, had it all laid out. And they're actually really not worried about this at all. It's all different. It's different all across the board. So I think we're going to learn a lot. This is not the last time we're going to talk about this. If you listen to the podcast, we're going to circle back around on it again. Goal is actually to have Larry on really soon. I talked to Larry last week and I said, we need to have you on and have a deeper discussion around the five points of value and really helping people get behind that. And he's all in. So that will be happening very soon. I love it. All right. Well, let's move on to another. Did we cover that? I mean, the people that are here, are we okay with where we stand with the lawsuit right now? Thank you so much. I feel like, like you, you look like you're like, yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. I can, I can have some more. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's move on. To, this is a good question. Cause you know, since y'all are here at an installation, you're going to leave with a lot of momentum, a lot of like good ninja energy. How many people are here with like a group of people you're here as like a team or a brokerage? Look at that. That's awesome. How many of you are here by yourself as a solo? All right. About, I'd say split, maybe a little bit in favor of the team. So it makes sense. Cause there's more of you. But this is a good question, which is how do you keep the ninja momentum going when you're surrounded by people who haven't been through ninja, which is outrageously common, particularly if you're here on your own? Yeah, it's it's one of the number one things we see is that you you can go back to your office and if you've got a team of agents to go play with, with all of your great systems and your dialogues that you've learned, it's really fun because you can start groups and you can start little discussion you know, pods going on. But when you're all alone and you go back and you're going, okay, where are my next steps? Because it's so easy to fall back in to that groove. You get right back in, life kicks right back in, kids kick right back in. All of a sudden, just everything, everything just takes back over. And I think it's one of the number one places that we watch people saying, oh yeah, Ninja, I went to that one time. I should probably go back again. Usually it's the individuals that I find that in the most. Is that what you'd see? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, when you have the culture, if your company already has Ninja built into it, it's a lot easier to stay on that path. You may have a manager who's helping you track your numbers. But as a solo agent, it's tough. And this actually was, it wasn't my experience when I first discovered Ninja in a way, but it kind of became that way for me. So I went to Ninja with a group of managers uh, I was an assistant manager at the time, which I was like, man, why didn't I have this when I wasn't in this position? Because I could have like had a few more years of maybe selling under the Ninja system before now just managing it. And we came back with a lot of energy and then it kind of just, it faded out a little bit, right? Some people kept it, some people didn't, but we didn't have systems in place to help people stay on the path other than just ourselves. And I'd say one thing that if you're worried about this is lean into one, your materials, Right you have the book, you have the Ninja installation manual, you have the Ninja selling book, you have Garrett and I as a podcast. I was going to say, what about us, dude? Yeah. Well, I mean, you got us, you got the audio book, like make sure that you keep the Ninja stuff in your world, right? If you listen to the book, if you listen to content, you'll keep thinking about, oh yeah, maybe I should go back and look at my Ninja 9. You all have in your box, people that are here, if you're listening to this, maybe you have this, maybe you don't, <laughs> the Ninja planner, which whether you like paper planners or not, that's not the thing. But I want, you want you to do is look at that and say, hey, how can I use this to help me stay on track with just taking action, right? And one of the biggest things that you can do to keep momentum is do the actions. Even if you're like, my mindset's struggling, I still need to build my skill set. Take action on what you've learned with Ninja, and that's going to keep you moving in a good rate. Yeah, that was going to be my number one thing is as fast as you can going back, get a routine put in place. Get something in place that you you are going to make a commitment to to show up. Also, it's not like oh, this would be nice if I could actually follow through with this. Like I have a a pretty strict way that I run my calendar, which is is that if it gets time in my calendar, I'm making a commitment to that activity. If I'm not willing to make a commitment to that activity, it doesn't get any time in my calendar. So I have to have a conversation. It's not just like let's just build it out and this will be fun and this is my new ninja routine that I'm going to make for myself. It's very much every single activity. Do I understand the importance of that, the activity that's going on? Can I answer all the questions about who is this benefiting? What am I doing? Why am I doing this? You know, where does it take me when I'm going to actually perform this activity? And at the end of it, if I'm not all on board, I delete it and I pull it off and I got to figure out, you know, one, how can I make it important enough that I'm going to commit to it? Or maybe what else do I need to put into place? That's what I would recommend to anybody who's getting into this and coming back from the installation is, is that you need to make yourself a plan that you're willing to commit to. But then once it gets your time, you got to look like it if you had, and Dennis said this a couple of times today, but like, what if you had a real job 
that would fire you if you didn't show up. And there's a lot of real jobs out there will do it. And the crazy thing about real estate is you don't get fired. You just slowly let go is what they slowly let you go on your own. And then all of a sudden, someday you go, you know what? Maybe I should not renew my license. And then all of a sudden you go get something else and you move down a different path. You don't typically make a hard break in real estate. So uh, I'm going to say make the commitment right now. And that's how I would work the calendar. Well, so Gary, to, to piggyback on this, what what if we're in a situation where, okay, we have like an active office, but they don't do Ninja. I'm being encouraged to do other systems. I'm being encouraged to do some of the things that aren't Ninja. And, you know, I just want to be free from those distractions so I can focus on my Ninja 9 versus... Is this like when you go back and they give you your list of leads you're supposed to call? Something like that. Okay. Because that, that happens. <laughs> or you have the uh, the top producer in the office come back and be like, wow, you learned all that stuff. That's great. You know what? I just found this awesome lead platform that I'm buying leads from. You know, you may want to look at that too. Or they bring in the next seminar right behind it. How many of you ever had like the kind of rotating seminars that can kind of come through your office place? Have anybody ever experienced that? One, maybe six months you get Ninja, then you get another different platform and then another platform kind of rolls through. Or you go to a conference and you listen to a guy talk and you're like, wow, that sounds really cool too. Yeah. I think um, one is, and I'm not here to promote a huge amount, but like we do have mastery and mastery is an incredible way to come back and get around a whole bunch of like-minded realtors all over the United States. Usually it's about a hundred people that are involved in those groups and you get broken out into a uh, it's a great spot to be able to say, look, these are people that are kind of walking the same line that I'm right now and want to stay on the path. There's also the podcast community. And I find in there, you don't have to put your hand up very high to say, I want help. I want a group to be able to share time and energy with. Somebody will meet with me on a weekly basis. And I'm always blown away how fast a group oh, yeah. is formed. Which, by the way, if you're not in our Facebook group, just go on Facebook and search for The Ninja Selling Podcast. It's the fastest growing community in the universe. I don't know. We, those do we of have, you listen already know. Do we have stats on that? Uh, lots. Okay. Just, that's that's the answer <laughs> to any question on it. Lots. <laughs> but there is, there's like, what, 13,700 people in that group? Yeah. And, I, and I've been tracking. There's about, uh, about on average, about 5,000 to 6,000 people that hit that page every single day. So if you go in there and you throw a question in, or if you're struggling, if you go home and you're like, I'm just not getting my legs underneath me, how many of you have been to an installation? This is not a question for you in the room. But you can pose it in the group and say, you know, how many of you have been to an installation and not had the momentum once you've come home and want to not do that again? Like, I'm looking for support. I guarantee you'll find people that will jump in the pool with you. I think two or three accountability groups have been formed just out of people posing that question where yeah. someone's like, hey, I'm looking for an accountability partner. A bunch of people jump in on the comments and then hopefully they connected outside of that and they've, they've formed some groups where... They're just hopping on Zoom maybe once a week or once every other week, and they're doing their Ninja 9 just on mute. And so they're like, hey, we showed up. It's like being in the office together. That's a really... I did hear about to, that. They literally, they literally jump that. on the call. Yeah. I have two clients now that, do, that have groups of ninjas around the country that do that once a week. Did you, so did everybody catch that? They jump on on mute and they do their system. They're not trying to interact with each other but they can see each other on Zoom and they know there's a group doing the exact same thing that they're doing right now at that moment in time, which makes you not sit there and feel like you're just all alone going through your processes. Yeah. It's like if you have like a gym partner, right? If you show up to the gym, like you don't have to work out, but since you did and your partner's there, you're like, I might as well work out now because we're here. Same thing with an accountability group. It's like, well, we're here, so I guess we're going to make some phone calls. We're going to do some handwritten notes, whatever it is on your agenda to do with that group. That's so, a really good way of doing it. Yeah, I think that's one of the best. So there you go. If you're watching, looking for that momentum and you don't have the ninjas around you, there's plenty of ninjas around the country and the globe who will love to hop on with you. You pulling up a, a question out I'm of I'm not just checking my... My checking text. your email? Yeah, I'm just checking oh, my okay. email right now. You can keep talking. Oh, it's like what Dennis was saying about being connected to the conversation well, today and the installation. What were you saying? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, what's our question here? How do you stay focused and get back on the Ninja Systems when you have multiple distractions? Could be other jobs, family, et cetera. Maybe best discipline techniques. It's a question for you, Matt. Yeah, it's a, it's a good one because life happens, right? We actually just recorded an episode on this, actually, I think, particularly as a realtor, right? Like who, how many people in this room, and for those of you listening, 
right now in the recording, raising your hand. We could be like, oh, raise your hand, driving the car, people are looking at you. Raise your hand if you got into this business because you wanted to have a more flexible lifestyle. And then raise your hand if you then got into the business for that and then found out like, oh my gosh, this business is owning my lifestyle, right? Yeah, because we find out like, hey, this I, that was me too. Right? How many of you are afraid to get better because it's going to take more of your life? Like if I actually create more business, it might take more of my life. Is there any fear around that? I've seen yeah. a lot of people, I call no, them professionals. They are at a level that they're cranking a lot of business and they're like, I want to do more, but if I have to give up more of my life, I'm not willing to do it. And then there's the opposite. How many of you have had situations where life has happened and you're like, well, I, I can't do the business right now. Raise your hand. That's happened. I mean, it's happened to me. So Joe, thank you. Appreciate you. So I'd say in, in terms of one, it depends on what it is. There's varying levels of life happening, right? I mean, when there's like the most intense things, like if there's a really difficult family situation going on, like family first, always, that's my point of view, right? At the same time, it's like, but if the family's relying on you to put food on the table too, we got to figure that out. If you had a regular, quote, nine to five job, you wouldn't be like, well, I'm just not going to go into work today because you'd be worried about getting fired. You'd figure out a way to how can I get to work and still handle my family situation. And that's something that we got to do. How blessed are we to be able to have a business where you don't have to go nine to five? So you can actually maybe just reduce a few hours or split your hours and still take care of whatever is going on when life happens. One thing for me, I mean, um, as many of you might know, if you listen to the podcast, I like doing things like 75 hard and stuff like that doesn't mean I'm like some outrageously crazy disciplined person. But in doing programs like that, I figured out, hey, you know what? There's 24 hours in a day. And you know what? Some days when times get busy and life happens, I might sleep less. I might be working at night. I might be going against what like people are like, oh, but a true ninja doesn't do all those things. Like, But we have the flexibility to handle what comes at us. And so if we have to adjust and do things on off hours and stick to making sure that no matter what happens, I'm going to do my Ninja 9 today. I'm going to get these notes out the door. Yeah, life happened, but it's going to take me 10 minutes. If I sit down and write these notes right now, I can have these notes done, right? And you can stick to, I mean, it's hard, but that's my first reaction to that. Well, and I think with staying disciplined and, you know, working through distractions too, and it mentioned, you know, in the question, kids, and, and actually mentioned other jobs, which always makes me go, ah, like, hold on, like, want to get one really good at one job, but we have another job. And I get it. There's people in the room that might have other jobs. So I appreciate that if that's where you're at. But I think one of the interesting things, Matt, that I learned from you many years ago is I always said the word work-life balance or a balance between the things that I love and the things that make me money. And uh, one of the great takeaways that you gave me was finding a way to harmonize those activities. I didn't realize it, but I have always done that in my world where I've got lots and lots and lots of stuff going on, but then it's well, how can we tie this all together so that when I am actually with my kids, I'm actually working when I'm actually going and some of you might heard that I like to go racing. And so when I'm racing, like how can I tie the racetrack into the things that I love and the people that are my close friends and going and hanging out and goofing out with them? Like how can I circle this all back around so that it all works together? So then you're not trying to have to weigh it all out and I think you could even do that with a, with a job or a second job, which is to say, yeah, I am here at this other job right now, but it doesn't stop me from asking forward questions. It doesn't stop me from building relationships. You might work at a school while you are working to get your real estate license, and you still have this great opportunity to say, I can write handwritten notes and make this great impact on all these people. I can start doing my mailing list and getting my marketing all going out there and with the goal of saying these things that and I'm stuck on the job one right now because I'm going like with the, with the hope of getting rid of the other job as fast as we can so we can simplify things and really tie the, the necessity stuff together. Yeah. Well, let, let's talk about the job thing because we did do a full episode on, on life happening as well. And, and I think it's and that's probably what is the crux of that question is, I mean, how many people worked another job as they were getting into real estate? Maybe. Right. Yeah. A lot of people here. And what a lot of people say, well, you can't be in real estate unless you're quote full time. And listen, I get it. We got to put food on the table. And sometimes that means I got to work this other job. Full time is a mindset. And so if for the first answer I'd have for this person, what do you do when you have this? It's like, well, get into a full time mindset with the things that you do. I do a few different things, right? We got mm -hmm. podcasts, you coach, you run a coaching business and you do a podcast, right? And you have all the things that you handle in life. I coach, have a podcast with you, have a postcard company, 
and life and all the things that happen there. A lot of people have multiple things that they do. But if you go into it with a full-time mindset and you understand that that harmony is going to be a crucial role of like, hey, some some areas of life, I'm going to have to be all in here. Some it's all in here and some it's like a little bit of both at the same time. But the cool thing with real estate, as you were kind of going into is it blends into everything else that you do because you can ask Ford questions to everybody. You said the word all into it. I want to jump on that just for yeah. a second because we talk about it in Ninja, which is 100% full on. And I think that that's a big piece. All of it. I think we like we sometimes dabble in a lot of stuff. And I've always been a big one. If you're going to do it, like go all the way, like just just throw yourself into whatever you're doing. I'm not a big one. And just like just kind of dip my toe in the water over here and then a little bit over here, because after a while, you're like, I'm not making progress really in anywhere. Like I'm not really getting anywhere. So I'd say like with all those distractions, I think one of them you got to say probably say no to some stuff and then jump all in with other stuff. Usually what I would see. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say, I mean, there's going to be tough decisions that you have to make when you have a lot of things going on. You might have to be saying no to things that you really enjoy that you want to do because you're saying yes to, Hey, the next year, what's going to look like in a year. It's like, yeah, I could fit that in right now, but if I stay disciplined with this for this week, in one year, that's going to mean my, I'm through this storm and my life's going to be totally different. I'm able to get rid of that job that I don't want to have anymore because my real estate business is thriving, right? Yep. I have another question. I think we should move on. Let's do another question and then bring Dennis in. Really? Yeah. All right. Dennis, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question that came up online and it was about the Sweet 16 listing presentation, the 10-step buyer's process. Anybody who's in this room with us right now that has been through an installation, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Any of you that are brand new in this room with us right now, you're going like, I have no idea what this 10-step buyer's process is in the Sweet 16 listing presentation is. But the question that came up online was, in this new time that we're going through right now, and in years that are going to be coming up here, what needs to change about that process and how do we need to handle it differently so we can still get the results that we want to get? And it's a really simple answer. No, nothing. Dennis, you want to come up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I would just, I'm mean, just going to, yeah, come on up. We're going to, I want to uh, just amplify that. Like, so I don't, I don't want anybody changing any of the ninja systems. I've watched people over the years take their systems home and they go, oh, they should be different because my marketplace is different. Well, I'm in a second home market, so they're going to be different here. And as this marketplace is adjusting, again, I don't want any of you to change any of the Ninja systems. They are built on relationships. They're built on bringing value. They're built on bringing trust. And the 10-step buyer's process and the Sweet 16 listing presentation is all about asking the right questions so you can learn where people need to go and how you're going to help them get there. So don't change a darn thing. Yeah. It works in, I mean, as we say, it works in any market. When I went through the installation, I worked for a company that specialized in luxury real estate. And a lot of people were like, yeah, but like this, this stuff doesn't work in the luxury market. This isn't going to work with my luxury clients. And well, you know, it did because the people who were doing Ninja were all of a sudden doing a lot better. And the people who resisted it all of a sudden were doing not as well. But Dennis, you teach all over the country. We should probably introduce Dennis. Oh, yeah. I forgot it. You, oh, you said special guest. You didn't actually say who it was going to be. Yeah. So, so why don't or, you... Like, do you want to take it? Do you want me to take it? Because people are listening. Oh, right. Dennis I'm not sure Gianetti I'm I'm not sure who I am right is now. with us right now. So for those of you listening, Dennis Gianetti is an incredible ninja selling guide. I've known Dennis for, for many years because he was... Uh, I went to several of his installations when I was starting out as a coach. And we had a lot of a lot of fun spending some time with each other. And he's absolutely incredible in Florida. He's also a black belt. So he actually really is a ninja too. Really like that's is. the cool thing. Like he's a legit ninja. I have skills. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm grateful to have you on the pod. We've never had you on the podcast yet. So I'm grateful to have you here, especially in this environment. We're getting the chance to spend this is my first time actually seeing you teach an entire installation. How long have you been doing this for? First, before I answer that, I just want to say thank you to all of you who are here. And Mike and Novella Taylor, thanks so much for having me years ago, hosting this, because uh, I got to tell you, you guys are true ninjas and true friends, and I appreciate you both. And that's uh, ERA Wilder is hosting this installation. So thank you to them for hosting the installation, which is awesome. So Dennis, how long you been um, with Ninja Selling? Because you have a long history with Ninja Selling. Yeah, I, I mean, it, ultimately it was around 2008, 
And I'd gotten to work with a company where I was creating these training programs for them doing coaching, so on and so forth. And the owner who was a fantastic guy. He says, listen, I'm going to go up and see this speaker. His name is Larry Kendall. I believe it was in South Carolina. Do you want to go? And he was really cool because he was like, you know, if you want to keep your stuff, we'll keep your stuff. I love your stuff. But I hear the stuff's really good. So let's give it a shot. Let's see what he says. I saw Larry Kendall speak and he came to us afterwards. We had a good hour and a half conversation. We got back on the plane. I said, I'm in. That was it. So from 2008 on, I was doing internal consulting for two different top companies in South Florida. We were doing installations probably four to eight times a year. And we had an internal program as well to make sure people were following up and doing what they need to do. Let me tell you the importance of coaching when it comes to making Ninja work is critical. We wouldn't have had the success we did internally without it. So incredible. So again, you're not new to this. You've been around this game for a while. We've known each other for how many years now? Well, I'm 165 years old, so. <laughs> I can, not, a, not a day over, by no, the way. Are you, I think you're, you and I, my goodness, it was you know, the first retreat that I went to, you were there. So was that around that time, 2008? I, 2008. Right. I was at all of them back then. So yeah. that's been a long time. So I think so it's that time. I think it's been awesome to watch as you've grown with Ninja on your own and then taken it and actually grown with it as an instructor. It's been incredible. You know, one of the things I was interested in kind of having you on the panel with us today is you get a chance to go and actually get into marketplaces. Like I get to work with an individual agent here and agent here. We get to see a lot of different markets. But it's different when you have to take on an entire room that says, but you don't understand my marketplace. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's different, but, it, but it's also not true. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's, you see, we, we always can look at the different things in life that are going on and find a reason to point the finger. But the markets always shift. The question is, do we? And that's not so much in the system that we're using because Ninja works everywhere, but it's the mindset that has to shift. Look, if your business isn't working, Ask yourself, who owns that business? You do. If you don't like the way it's going, then fire yourself and reinvent yourself, utilizing a mindset that doesn't let things like a market shift or this new law, whatever it is, deter you from creating the life that you want. You're going to have buyers and sellers all the time change their mind. You could change your mind too, but stay on the course. That's the best thing about the ninja selling system. It works in any market, but you have to work it. You yeah. can't have reasons and excuses why it doesn't work if you're not working it. Yeah, I, I have yet to find a marketplace, even after all the dust settles and we've had to you know, work through all the excuses of well, why not this, why not this, why would it work here? At the end of the day, I've still, second home markets, anything, uh, yeah. I've found that it, it just stays true. Yeah, it's incredible. Well, so Dennis, you have, uh, I think, an incredible ability of also focusing in on like the mindset piece. You brought a mindset. And, you know, I know there's a hundred different things that we can do to work on mindset. You've yeah. taught the mindset component of this installation. I mean, hundreds of times probably, right? Well, I'm not good at counting, but I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Give or take. So, you know, for someone who's struggling with a mindset, you know, which is when we look at some of these questions that we have, a lot of them can just go back to that, right? Right. So what would you suggest to somebody who needs like a couple of minute pep talk and like, hey, here's some things that you can focus on to get your mindset pointed in the right direction because it's not always cured right away. But at least if we can turn it around and point it in a better direction, we can start to make progress. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, hard times make strong people. Strong people get great success. So when you're struggling, that is a gift. It isn't a problem. At the end of the day, you're there to get harder and better at what you do. And you can't do that without a problem. If everything was easy all the time, you'd never grow. How is that possible? You can't get healthier without working out. You got to eat better. You can't have a better relationship unless you work on it. You can't have peace of mind if you're always keeping yourself busy. The problem is we get caught up in the problems and then use them as excuses as to why we're not going to do things or what's not working. But the problems are there to teach you. You don't win or you lose, you win or you learn. And when you get that, nothing really gets in your way. And that's the beautiful thing to reiterate about the system. Once you get that through your mind and once you understand that you're more than capable and everything's there just to change you and challenge you, then all of a sudden you say, okay, my mindset's right. I'm back where I need to be. Go back to the system. That's the key. I mean, oh, my car battery's dead. All right, charge it up, get in the car, follow the GPS. It's funny you say go back to the system because we hear that all the time. Yeah. It's like you watch people get off course and they're like, oh, you know what? I just got to go back to the basics. I'm like, what if you just did the basics all the time? Just, just did that. <laughs> it would work. I mean, most, I will tell you, I've got a lot of martial arts background, but what would actually win in a fight is about six different things. And that's it. People don't realize that. Like, oh, look at that guy. They could do this. They could do that. He can kick someone in the head. Not in the street. You can't. You go to kick them in the head in the street, they're going to knock you down. They're going to knock you out. I've wanted to surprise you sometime. Like, just jump up behind you and jump on your back. Would that be a bad idea? Only for you. 
<laughs> and I love want. you, brother, so I don't want to do that I kind of I want to see what you got. No, you don't, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> All kidding aside, that is an interesting point you bring up, though. How we act, we act like we're surprised when markets shift or how we act like we're surprised when a seller says no or we're not getting exactly what we want. You shouldn't be surprised. You should expect those things because they're going to happen. Wouldn't it be awesome if everything was always good and always the same? No, what are we boring? All these things that happen to us that challenge us will change us in a good way. Someone does something to you, say in a fight, for example, that you weren't expecting, I guarantee you they won't be do doing that again because you'll learn from that mistake because the pain's going to create the need to figure it out. Is that a threat? Oh, seriously. Come on. <laughs> I got mad on my side, dude. <laughs> Between the 75 hard and my Kung Fu, you might want to get a gun. Just say, <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, so I want to I resonate with that just real quick, just for a second, because you know, we watch these tougher marketplaces and these changing marketplaces that we're going through. And yeah. I always go back. So I, I started coaching and got into real estate in the early 2000s. And I've seen a lot of marketplaces come and go. I've seen some that are rip roaring fast. And I've seen some that people are going, oh my gosh, will I ever sell a house again? And, and my daughter's getting into the real estate right now. So I'm watching her as she's going in and getting her license. And I told her that, and I said, you're getting in at the best time ever right now. And the reason I was telling her that is because this isn't an easy business necessarily right now. For, it's not being handed to every real estate agent out there. And so as you get into this type of marketplace, you learn to be the best of the best right now. Where I saw a lock get in in 2004, 2005, 2006, and then very quickly hung their license up in 2007, 2008, 2009. The ones that got in in 2007, 2008, 2009 are the long-term realtors that are still with us today. So it's like these cycles that go through in these tougher times, like this is the time where you create raving fans. This is the time where you create those fabled service stories of people saying, I could never have done this without my professional. And it's really a gift is what we're in right now. You can run away from it or you can lean into it and really create some amazing future for yourself. It's interesting. He talks about 2007. I had an agent tell me something once. A lot of people thought in 2007, that was one of the worst markets to be a realtor. And this person had a different point of view. He said, let me tell you how I succeed and had my best year in 2007 when everybody was leaving the business. I go, how's that? He goes, when everybody decided to abandon their farm, I walked in, planted the seeds and then watered those seeds into plants or listings with your tears of regret for those of you who left. <laughs> His whole premise was if you can't handle it when it gets hard, you don't deserve it when it's good. I love that. I've never tried to grow crops with tears. <laughs> I, well, I don't, me either. But there must be, it must be magical tears like the magic beans. I don't know. Must be something. Well, there's, um, I'm going to take one of the questions that we got, combine two of them together, and maybe we can all tackle this question, which is, if you're moving from one career into real estate, we had a conversation about this and, and everybody knows me as this professional. How do I you know, help people see me as the realtor? And I'm going to combine that with also, what if I'm young? Like not young as a new to the business, but young in age. And how do I get over people saying, well, I'd love to work with you, but you're too young. That's, that's for you. Why well, young? <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. What would my daughter say? I know. I think what, when people say that, it's just because of a belief system that they have about youth. And they might have kids that are the age, right, that this particular agent is. They just got to ask for the chance and say, you know what, I respect that. And I understand that. If it's okay, I'd still like to meet with you. I'd like to show you what I can do. And if it's still a no, I personally, I understand. That's okay. But at least let me show it. Hey, with your experience, tell me what I could do better if you, if you don't like what I did. There's nothing to lose by getting an opportunity. And I think on the youth side of it, I think that, you know, you typically are surrounded by professionals. And I know when I got into the business and I first started selling, I was, I was young. I was in my early 20s. And uh, that was an opportunity for me to basically see. I remember my managing broker said, here's the years of experience you have if you just come and ask us questions. And I leaned into that a lot. And when I went and met with somebody, I brought their years of experience. And I said, I'm, I am newer into this business that they'd ask, but here's what I have like right at my fingertips that is of value that'll make sure that we're going to get you to where you need to go. So I don't think unless you are literally brand new and out on your own and you got nobody behind you, you might want to go circle around and find some professionals in your world. Yeah, it's a good suggestion. But you stacked a question. The first question yeah. I want to get to also. Yeah. And well, I'll just piggyback on what you were saying, because that's actually how I did it too. I started in my 20s and 
you know, used the power of the brokerage around me. You know, this is my experience. A lot of my friends weren't buying real estate at that time. And, but they still knew people, right? Even if you're young or like really young, let's say you're 18, you just got out of high school. You started at 18, right? That's when you got your license, Dennis. That's when I first got a license in Massachusetts. That's right. You know, so, okay. Yeah. Are 18 and 19 year olds typically buying houses? Not really, but their parents move particularly if you're really that young too, there was just a life change that happened for your parents. If you're the last one to leave the house that's right, or if you're the last one, they're trying to get out of the house. And I don't know about, but like, I look at my daughter, like the relationships that she has with her friends, parents, and all the high school connections that she's had over the years. Like she's got really tight bonds with a lot of parents out there that would happily go. I know we're supposed to have a professional that knows what they're doing, but Jocelyn, come on. Like, well, like, let's do this. Like, let's do this together because they love her. Like, yeah. and I think that that's where the relationships come down to. Also, you can be really young and still have a really amazing, trusting relationship with people. That's the key word. Because remember, people will do business with and refer those to they know, like, and trust. If I know you, I like you, I've seen you grow up and yeah. I trust you to be able to do the job. You're going to get a shot. Yeah. Not with everybody, but you can't put yourself down just because other people are stepping on you at the moment. Learn from it and move off to the side. I was a speaker at 25 years old. I used to speak to managers and they go, what could you teach me? And I said, with that attitude, nothing, right? <laughs> you can't, you gotta be open. So all I asked them for was an opportunity and I never really taught them anything as I did what you just said. I asked questions, I listened. I asked them more questions based off what they said. I listened and that built trust and they didn't judge me on what I did or didn't know, but that I was actually listening to them, that I was there for them and I heard what they were saying. When, when you're young, you have a long runway which leads into the, a lot of the suggestions and strategies might be similar to if you're moving from a career where people know you as, you know, a police officer, a firefighter, a teacher, whatever it is. And now you're saying, hey, how do I shift what people see of me? Same thing when you're young. Hey, people see me as this young person. How do I have them see me as a realtor? So what are some things that we can do there to kind of like help our current sphere? Because we say you do business with the people that know you first, but they know me, Dennis, yes. as this other person. Right. Well, and the question is, how, who were you and how were you to them as that other person? First of all, I was great. Yes, of obviously. Course. Like, it's almost I a rhetorical mean, question. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, yeah. it's a, but, it's, but it's an interesting point because you could have left an industry that maybe you aren't leaving right. because you loved it. You might have been just struggling through making that job work for yourself. And it's not like I have this amazing relationship with all these people. Yeah. So I think there's a that transition of not only, it's not like you're just taking the best job with you ever and all these awesome people and being now I'm a realtor. You might have some serious rebuilding to do also. Yeah. And well, and if you're great at what you do and you believe in what you do and you believe in yourself, it'll work out. People always want to work with people who believe in themselves, believe in them and believe in what they do. I mean, if I say to you, look, I really love what I do. I really want to make value difference in your life. And by the way, I love what I do. You'd at least listen to what I have to say. And that's the idea. So when people are transitioning, if they were excellent where they were, they'll be excellent where they're going because excellence is a character trait. It's not where you were. So then going back to there's the, the being excellent in the industry, but the next part is how do you change the mindset of someone that has seen you in a role for years and now all of a sudden they're going, oh yeah, that's right. You sell real estate. Like I, yeah. I, I, I totally forgot about that. Yeah, It's really hard to get referrals when you have that type of relationship. Yeah. With well, my first question is, how do they forget about it? Are you not marketing them on a monthly basis? <laughs> <laughs> so a, you've already screwed up by not marketing them. There's, there's a four letter word that begins with F that I'm thinking about that probably should be used and it's flow. Oh, not the other you, one. Thank oh. you. <laughs> I was about to move away, dude. I like, <laughs> that you should focus on because that's, that's how people are going to know that you're in real estate is by what is the frequency of your conversations yes. with them? Starting with live flow, like the phone calls, the in-person stuff, what is your frequency? I always tell people, the, the your business is going to be determined by the quantity and quality of your conversations. So if you have more conversations that are high quality and you do those consistently at a high frequency with people who know you, you're going to have real estate conversations, particularly if you're interested in them. Talk to them about what they do for work. That's the, on the Ford scale, I would go right at occupation with questions. Dennis, tell me about, how's business, man? What's going on in your world? And you're probably going to then ask me, well, it's, it's How's you. it going with you? Well, let me tell you, I actually <laughs> have moved into a new position. I'm, yeah. I'm in real estate now, right? And that's going to open up that real estate. And, not, and I wouldn't then go into, right. so do you need to buy or sell? Right. <laughs> Since I'm in real estate, and you know, I apologize. I think, I, was, I, thought, I didn't think I remember the name, but I think it was called Stockholm Syndrome. You guys hear that before? 
And so basically it's about people being taken as hostages, but because they spent so much time together, they started to get along. They started to connect and relate to each other. Now, I'm not saying you're going to take people hostage unless they list properties with you. <laughs> Let's not convey this in the wrong way. What I'm saying is it goes back to what he just said and what Gary's been saying about flow. It's kind of the same thing. The more familiar they are with you, talking to you, conversing with you, seeing your work, the more comfortable and the more trust they're going to have with the idea of working with you. Yeah. And Matt, I want to emphasize what you said about asking forward questions. People are genuinely nice. Would we all agree? At least that's what I've noticed about the population. So genuinely nice people like to reciprocate. So when you ask somebody, what are you doing for work and how's work going for you right now? It's very easy for them to follow up with, well, how's business going for you? Like, what do you, what do you got going on in your world? And it opens up that opportunity when you're changing from one career to a next to all of a sudden very comfortably be able to say, well, actually, I'm doing something different right now. And going back to Core Ninja, we can't talk about what we do unless they bring it up. So it's kind of an interesting way to circle it back around where it's not us saying, hey, I wanted to stop and tell you that I'm in real estate now. We're not the one going down that rabbit hole. But when they bring it up, all of a sudden you can have a nice conversation, but do not go, yes, here's my chance. Yeah. <laughs> do not do that. It's just let me, that. Let me tell you all about real estate and everything that I know, right? Right. right. But well, a software. And then you get to build on that by making sure you have the marketing, right? Yep. And you know, you have the auto flow going like Prosecco and Post does a great program where you get two postcards out there every month. I've heard um, great things. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever it is, a ninja we talk about, and, we're, and the people here, you're going to hear more about auto flow tomorrow. But if you have those three touches happening every single month where you have information, valuable information that's going to the people who know you that talks about real estate. It could be real estate stats. It could be stuff about home ownership. It could be stuff about the interest rates. It could be fun stuff that makes them laugh and, and reminds them that you have this type of personality. But those three touches a month that remind them that, hey, you're in real estate or I'm in real estate and I bring value that's different than other realtors, that's going to stand out so that when you have those live conversations, right? I mean, Dennis, when, when you travel around, yeah, you probably hear about a lot of different auto flow programs that whether companies have. And like when you see agents that are seeing success, I mean, most of them have some form of auto flow, right? Well, yeah. You know, I, I tend to say that when people get into the business, they're either in survival mode, sustainability mode, success mode, or scale. Our goal should always be to scale because when you're so successful that it actually hurts you to be doing the things that you can delegate out or automate out, you're losing money. You're a business owner. So don't try to do everything yourself all the time. Do what you're best at and give yourself time to enjoy the fruits of your labor. Delegate and automate. It's an investment in yourself. How can you, how can you continue to succeed at a higher level if it's just you, if you're doing everything, if you're, if you're the front and the back end and the side and all that kind of stuff, you have to do these things. And by the way, you have to do them frequently oh, yeah. because there's a lot of realtors out there you might be the best one, but you got to put that information out consistently. People are distracted all the time. Distract them with your stuff. And all of a sudden, they're going to remember you. So all in all, I think that that would probably be one of the number one approaches. I also, again, in changing somebody's mindset about what you used to do, I think all of us, and I, have we talked about real estate reviews yet at the class? No, we can no. do that if you want. No, we're not going to get all the way into real estate reviews right now. But the class that's sitting here in front of me right now, you're going to learn about this tomorrow. But those of you that are listening out there, I think real estate reviews are super underutilized with the opportunity as you are changing from one industry to another. And also, if you're already in this industry, let alone changing from another one, it's an amazing opportunity to give some value and help people understand that you can give great information. You can be there for them as a support. It's not always about trying to earn their business. It's always not, not about trying to get that sale. So I think we need to lean into that more as real estate agents. And I think especially as we look at the marketplaces coming up, we just need to continue to provide more value. So when they need help, they come directly back to us. Awesome. This has been great, man. I think- um, Yeah, I was going to look at the time. Yeah, we'll probably wrap it up here. And Les, uh, Dennis, do you have any final words yeah, that you want to share? Yeah, just two quick things. One, uh, I love you both. You're like brothers. I appreciate you both. And you make this experience of Ninja better for me every day. That's number one. So when, two, I, when I attack you, you're going to remember that. Well, that was, that, that was number two. Number two is when I leave, I'm going to do it facing you. <laughs> <laughs> Walk out backwards. Well, so I want to thank again, Hoogan Southern Kitchen and the team here. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. 
it's been great being here in their space. And thank you to everybody too, who's, who's attended here. I mean, this is only our second time doing this and and we have an amazing turnout. So thank you all for coming in and joining us and for everybody who sent in questions. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate you a whole lot. Always. And thanks everybody who's listening to this recording too, man. We appreciate you guys. And if, if you're listening to the recording and you're like, Hey, this was cool. How do I learn more about Ninja? Well, just head over to ninjaselling.com. You're going to find all the information there about finding a, a four-day training and installation. Maybe you can get one that Dennis is teaching. It would be amazing. He's pretty hard to get, but pretty hard. Pretty hard. He's I've a hot told. ticket. He's a hot ticket. Um, you can learn about the mastery program that, Garrett, you had mentioned during one of the Q&As there. Yes. And you can learn more about one-on-one -on -one coaching as well, which is where, as many of you know, Garrett and I spend most of our time. So thank you all for being here and for listening. Appreciate everybody listening. Thank Appreciate you. to everybody who joined us this evening. We've had so much fun. And uh, thanks so much. And we're out. If you enjoyed today's episode and would like more, visit us at the ninja selling podcast.com. There you will also find links for more information about ninja selling and coaching. Have an incredible day.